When you think of ancient Egypt, what comes to mind? Probably hieroglyphics, an elaborate sarcophagus, and of course, pyramids. Maybe a pyramid with a giant Bass Pro Shop logo on it. Because why not? It's Memphis, Tennessee, and Memphis was an ancient Egyptian city, so build a giant pyramid that's a Bass Pro Shop. The influence of ancient Egyptian architecture like this and art can be found all over the place. And the same goes for ancient Greek architecture, which is arguably more prevalent, at least in the Western world. Ancient Egyptian and ancient Greek art styles and architecture styles are iconic. It's easy to generalize different time periods throughout history and to imagine what things might have looked like or been like. For example, when you think of the Renaissance, you might picture paintings like these. And when the medieval era comes to mind, you might imagine knights or castles or maybe a woodcut like this one. And it wouldn't be surprising to find a similar looking woodcut from a close by region around the same time period. A medieval woodcut from Italy would look pretty similar to a medieval woodcut from France. Take a look at these two paintings, one made in China and the other made in Japan around the same time period. They have their differences, but there's a lot of obvious similarities between them. They both share that iconic style of Eastern Asia at the time. And it's not surprising they were two closely related cultures, at least geographically. From Shanghai to Fukuoka, it's about 548 miles or 882 kilometers. Similarly, from Athens, Greece to Alexandria in Egypt, you've got about 586 miles or 943 kilometers. That's almost the same distance from Shanghai to Fukuoka. When you think of ancient Egypt, you probably imagine the Great Pyramids, or maybe large, upright, rigid statues. On the other hand, when imagining ancient Greece, you might think of detailed marble statues of the human figure. Of course, they are two totally different civilizations whose golden ages existed hundreds of years apart. But still, why do we see such a contrast between ancient Egypt and Greece when compared to other regions that were making similar works? Before we talk about the art of each of these two cultures, it should be said that neither ancient civilization really had a direct translation for what we might call art today. The Greeks had the word techne. Many times this is translated to art, but it can also mean craft, skill, or technique. It can also even be translated to science. The ancient Egyptians, on the other hand, had no word for what we might call art today. They usually just had words for individual works, like statues or tombs. Many of the pieces you may recognize from ancient Egypt were created from anywhere between the Old Kingdom up until the end of the Ptolemaic Dynasty, when Cleopatra died and the Romans took over, all encompassing a span of over 2,000 years. Many of the recognizable ancient Greek artwork was created near the end of ancient Egypt, when Greece was experiencing a golden age that lasted about 400 years. Historians usually end this period either with the death of Alexander the Great, or like Egypt, when the Romans came knocking. That's obviously a long period of time for either civilization, and I don't want to compress all the art history down so much that it seems like the Egyptians and the Greeks were continually making one style of work for hundreds or thousands of years, and that their respective cultures never evolved. They did evolve, and often were inspired by one another. Egyptian artwork is often learned in tandem with its mythology and agricultural history. While Greek artwork is viewed as the primary vehicle for human proportions and elegant human sculptures. So why did Egypt and Greece maintain their signature styles? In short, it comes down to culture, purpose, and location. Many aspects of each type of art were deeply rooted in that nation's history, priorities, and beliefs. Egyptian and Greek art explored similar principles throughout history, but in execution, both were pretty different. Ancient Egyptian art began as rock carvings depicting the order of life or the stories of the gods. Britannica Online claims that art progressed alongside politics. Rather than striving to create the most accurate or artistically profound pieces of art, Egyptians had the goal of depicting balance and history to maintain the rigid principles the gods had laid out in the universe. Much of Egyptian art tells stories or uses symbols to convey a specific message. The Goodbye Art Academy, for instance, emphasizes how people were depicted in different sizes and skin tones as a way to distinguish occupation, gender, and class. As such, the methodology behind Egyptian paintings focused on giving out as much information as possible. 
A lot of Egyptian art was created to serve a specific purpose. Upper class families would often commission art to adorn tombs. On the whole, Egyptian art was made with a specific purpose in mind rather than for experimentation. Often, according to the World History Encyclopedia, Egyptian amulets were placed with the dead in service to those who had passed, while Greek necklaces and bracelets were used as wedding gifts or casual wear. On the other hand, art in Greece was more experimental. It lacked that stylization and large scale prevalent in many of the famous Egyptian works, in favor of a focus on human body proportions and all the elegant details. While Egyptian art was focused on pleasing the gods and fulfilling needs, Greek art served both as a means of conveying information and as a vessel for practicing celebrated principles. Some later pieces of Greek art were occasionally signed by their creators, which uh, is probably something you wouldn't have seen with the traditional Egyptian works, given that they weren't usually being made just for art's sake. Greek style is commonly associated with anatomy and the celebration of the human figure. It's from the Greek style that a lot of Renaissance artists like Michelangelo would take influence when crafting things like the Statue of David. In some of the most well-preserved Egyptian artwork, we can see a lot of color. Most of the time these days, Greek art and Roman art, which was influenced heavily by Greek culture, are usually seen as like marble statues, completely white. Originally, a lot of these were painted, but the color just wore off over time. Another large element of Greek art was vase decorating, or vase, or vase. Because vases were made with a specific purpose in mind that dictated their size and shape, each vase was adorned with a simple repeating geometric shape to make them a little more appealing for everyday use. Later on, the use of vases were described a little more clearly with a black figure painting. Black coloring would be applied to the vases and figures would be etched on. Later on down the road, red figure pottery, which is generally the inverse of black figure painting, came into play. Black paint covers most of the vase, except for the outline of figures, usually people or animals. Often, Greek architecture made use of large, complex columns that held up triangular pediments. These buildings were created similarly to Egyptian temples, largely to depict and worship gods. Both cultures can be seen conveying cultural norms and exploring depictions of the human body, but stark differences in medium and visual and the general aesthetic are undeniably deviant from one another. That being said, the uniqueness of each art style did not prevent influence from seeping into one culture from the other. Throughout much of history, the relationship between Greece and Egypt was cordial, and both cultures were openly inspired by one another. Since around 600 BC, Greeks would tour Egypt. The Metropolitan Museum of Art notes that Greek commercial enclaves were established there after the Greeks would find luck in port cities, trading pottery and other goods. During the classical period between 480 and 323 BC, Greece was actively attempting to advance its art and create a more individual style rather than simply interpreting others. In one other form of intermingling between the two peoples, Greek leaders would often supply troops to assist Egypt, for the two had a common enemy, the Persians. Egypt lived peacefully with the aid of Greek armies until finally being conquered in 346 BC. Persia conquered a large stretch of Asia from India to Egypt and parts of Greece. Among the Greeks, ongoing turmoil between city-states and with the Persians led to the organization of large armies and a desire for conquest. Enter Alexander the Great. Born in Macedonia in 456 BC, Alexander would fill the shoes of his father Philip. Equipped with massive armies, scientific and artistic education, and enormous influence, Alexander would continue to fight the Persians in light of his father's death in Thebes and as revenge for the Persians' failed conquest of Greece hundreds of years prior. Part of tearing down the Persian Empire involved conquering Egypt. While there, he would be enamored by Egyptian architecture. The most famous product of Greek and Egyptian relations is likely the famed Library of Alexandria and the famous burning of the library. The library was founded in Egypt by Alexander to gather and preserve of knowledge from surrounding regions. Some Greek priests took so much from Egyptian language conventions in their work that historians have a hard time compartmentalizing certain works of literature from the time. After Alexander's death, the Macedonian Empire would be reorganized by his generals who he left behind. In Egypt, the kingdom would eventually succumb to division, but Alexander's influence and Greek influence over Egypt would persist for centuries. 
one of the most drastic changes being the introduction of Greek architecture. Elaborate temples were built, this time with more of a focus on the exterior, as the Greeks did. Eventually, Egypt would be conquered again by the Romans this time around, and much of the Greco-Roman influence persists to the modern day. Despite amicable relations throughout history, and similar explorations in media and figure drawing, why did Egypt and Greece hold on to these signature, iconic styles that everyone still recognizes today? Many stark differences between Greek and Egyptian culture and location maintained the dissonance between art styles, though many similar messages were found in each. The actual purpose of the work remained an important factor for art creation among both cultures. Egypt continued to make enormous religious pieces of art to favor their gods, while Greece continued to experiment with proportions and temples detailing their mythology. During his conquest of Egypt, it's likely that Alexander the Great had no intention of eradicating Egyptian art or culture. Often, Egyptian priests were allowed to continue teaching and spreading influence. The Metropolitan Museum of Art points out that artistic differences were not eradicated, but celebrated. The museum states that the Ptolemaic rulers supported Egyptian cults and priesthoods. While cultural assimilation wasn't particularly enforced, the ruling class still desired to maintain its Greek cultural roots. According to Egyptologist Stefan Pfeiffer, kings during this time had to comply with a multitude of different role expectations which were attributed to him by his Macedonian, Greek, and non-Greek soldiers. In addition to influence from the dependent and formal independent Greek city-states of his empire. Pfeiffer clarifies that there was no singular king of Egypt. Instead, several dynasties of Egypt were overlooked by rulers chosen by Ptolemy. As such, Ptolemaic kings worked together to maintain their Greek persona while taking note of their non-Greek citizens. The Greeks and Egyptians continued to strive towards their separate goals. Egyptian and Greek art styles have persisted in popular culture thanks to their recognizable features and fantastic innovations in the world of art and architecture. The influence from both ancient Egypt and Greece was highly influential, and you don't need to look far to find it. Each respective style is pretty commonly found all around us, whether it be government buildings, artistic installments, or the inside of a cheesecake factory for some reason. <laughs>